Thank you. Thank you very much uh, indeed, Mr. Chairman, for uh, this uh, very nice presentation and very flattering presentation. Uh, minister, members of Parliament, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, you mentioned, Mr. Chairman, that uh, uh, the standing invitees were uh, observed also when Gorbachev came here. Uh, he was asking you whether you were saying that to all your invitees in order to <laughs> greet them uh, nicely. But I cannot resist uh, mention the story I was told by John Major on uh, Soviet Union. I will not say on, particularly on Monsieur Gorbachev, but he was saying that once he had to go to, uh, to Moscow uh, with uh, a team of the Treasury uh, as Prime Minister, and uh, it was... Uh, to look at the situation of the Soviet Union economy. So the first question he asked the leader of Soviet Union was, could you sum up the situation of the Soviet economy in one word? And after due reflection and meditation, the head of Soviet Union told him, well, in one word, I would say good. <laughs> which, of course, triggered absolute stupefaction in the British delegation, according to John Major. And so the question was, uh, could you elaborate a little bit? I'm very surprised. It's not at all what we have in our own uh, documents and uh, in the files that we have been um, preparing in London. Uh, the situation looks much more complex, obviously. Could you elaborate in two words? And then after due and long meditation, the heads of Soviet Union, I don't say it is Mr. Gorbachev, <laughs> said, to sum up in two words, I would say, no good. <laughs> so I, I will try not to be as concise <laughs> as my predecessor here. <laughs> uh, and I will, uh, I will elaborate, as you have uh, indicated, on the external and internal dimensions of Europe's competitiveness. This are very challenging times for Ireland, for Europe, and for the global economy. I'm very, very pleased to be here today when last year the Institute of International and European Affairs kindly invited me to give a lecture on Europe's competitiveness. I was delighted to accept the opportunity to look at Europe's economy from a broad perspective and to focus particularly on the growing challenge of globalization. And uh, as uh, the title of uh, this address today, I have chosen uh, the external and internal dim dimensions of Europe competitiveness. Those two dimensions are closely interrelated, in my opinion. And they are also related to the current situation, which is quite different, obviously, from the current situation we were experiencing when I was invited. I will therefore also take the opportunity to talk about the economic crisis, its impact on Europe as a whole, and on the Irish economy. Developments in the international economy were always likely to have a particular impact on this country, reflecting its very open nature and its strong dependence on international trade and financial flows. But it is important that we fully recognize the global nature of this crisis in which public authorities everywhere in the world are confronted by the adverse effects of the market turbulence on their own economy and financial systems. And it is important to recognize that despite these difficulties, we have not lost the things that have made our real economy so successful in recent years notably our talented workforces, our dynamic businesses, and our openness to trade. Let me start by focusing on the topics suggested to me by the hosts of today's event. I would like to address some specific aspects of the external performance of the euro area and of the euro area countries. And I would like to discuss how they relate uh, to key internal dimensions, including integration, flexibility, and competition, drawing your attention to policy changes that are necessary to maintain and improve Europe's competitiveness. As I will argue, those reforms will not only help the European economy, 
to succeed in an increasingly globalized world, they are also crucial for getting through the current situation. So what do I mean exactly by competitiveness? For many people, competitiveness is a disconcerting word suggestive of pressures to change and constant adjustments. And as we know, these pressures can have personal and social costs. But there are very large benefits. We need to stay competitive for the long-term welfare of the people of the Euro area. What does the word competitiveness mean to economists? In a narrow sense, but only a narrow sense, it is often used to refer to international price competitiveness as measured by the various indicators of uh, prices taking into account the effective exchange rates. At the European Central Bank, we analyze developments according to a whole host of such indicators. This concept of competitiveness is linked to the external performance of a country, typically measured in terms of export growth, shares of export markets, or current account balances. Developments in price competitiveness have always been important drivers of an economy's ability to compete in international markets. But in recent years, other factors have become increasingly important. Uh, and um, uh, in the face of uh, the structural changes engendered by globalization, these relate to export specialization, which includes the range and the quality of the products of a country exports and the particular markets it exports to. In this regard, it is important that our countries take advantage, full advantage, of the high technological advancement and well-educated labor forces to produce higher quality and more sophisticated goods and to redirect their exports towards strongly growing markets. Looking even more closely into the domestic structure of an economy, we come to the notion of productivity. Productivity and competitiveness are two different concepts, but there are close links between them. Competitiveness, when more broadly defined, includes a notion of relative productivity. Under this definition, the most competitive economy is the one with the best prospects for generating highly productive firms contributing to longer-term economic growth and ultimately, of course, to the welfare of its citizens. Recent advances in trade theory have stressed the connections between the external and internal dimensions of competitiveness, which have become increasingly relevant in a globalizing economy. Some of the latest economic models of trade see global competition as a selection mechanism in which only the most productive firms do business outside their national borders. Less productive firms, by contrast, which are unable to bear the transport and other costs related to foreign trade, are either forced out of business or remain confined to their domestic market. Countries in which highly productive firms can thrive are therefore also likely to do better in terms of their overall export performance, as this will allow more firms to compete successively in, uh, successfully in international markets. In general, these are countries with more intense domestic market competition, better technology, and greater openness to foreign competitors. These new models of international trade also stress the importance of countries' institutional framework, which may make market access easier and push domestic firms to innovate. According to this body of economic knowledge, continuing efforts to promote stronger competition and further market integration within Europe appear to be important tools for supporting and enhancing the global competitiveness of European firms. Applying these concepts to Europe, how do we assess our external competitiveness? How are European firms performing in globalized markets? 
globalization has given a fantastic boost to world trade. Over the past two decades, world trade has grown one and a half times faster than world output, and the difference, the elasticity of global trade in comparison with the global output has been considerably higher in recent years with a very strong acceleration in the last five, six years of world trade. Transport costs have dropped dramatically as have tariffs and the surge in information and communication technology has facilitated a global exchange of goods and services as well as globalized supply chains. More and more goods and services have become tradable and domestic companies have increasingly engaged in international trade. The euro area has actively contributed to the rise in international trade. Our continent has a long history in trading, but the openness of the euro area has increased that business markedly. In the mid-90s, exports of goods and services from the euro area were equivalent to around 30% of our GDP. Now they are equivalent to around 44% of our GDP. Earlier observers who had said, you might remember that, uh, that European integration could lead to a closing vis-à-vis -vis the outside world, the so-called fortress Europe, have proved to be utterly wrong. Quite the opposite has happened. Of course, Europe's trade has grown not only because of Asia's, and particularly China's, emergence as a fully-fledged trading partner, but also by the growing role of the Central and Eastern European countries. But even though we are roughly comparable to the size of the United States, the euro area is about 10 percentage points more open in terms of uh, GDP, and we are much more open than Japan, despite our larger size. This is an indication of why Europe has a key stake in global economic developments in all circumstances, and of course, particularly in the present circumstances. Europe's openness is also remarkable in international finance. And I, I, I uh, suspect it is much less known than our openness in international trade. Over the past decade, the stock of outward and inward foreign direct investment has virtually doubled as a percentage of GDP. And even more strikingly, the euro area is more open financially than other advanced countries like the US and Japan. In 2007, international financial assets and liabilities of the euro area, additioned and as a percentage of GDP, reach almost 160% of our GDP, compared with about 135% for the US and 90% for Japan. And this, of course, explains why we are also, in this respect, in the financial uh, uh, coupling with the rest of the world, we are, uh, of course, uh, depending very much on the uh, overall uh, global situation. Greater openness in trade and finance has, of course, created new challenges, which have rarely been as visible as today. And just as with the global financial crisis, global trade integration calls for constant adjustment. As low-cost competitors have emerged, the euro area, just like other advanced economies, has recorded some losses in world export market shares. These losses partly reflect the mechanical effect of the increasing shares of the new entrants, but the challenge for advanced economies remains to adjust their export portfolios according to their technological comparative advantages towards higher quality products and towards products that are more skill intensive and capital intensive. So what is the comparative advantage of the euro area in the global economy. Recent ECB analysis has looked at so-called Balassa indices of revealed comparative advantage. According to these indices, a country specializes in a specific product or sector 
if the share of that product or sector in the country's exports is higher than the share of that product or sector in world exports. This analysis suggests, somewhat uh, surprisingly, and in contrast to some other advanced economies, that the euro area specialization overall has not changed much over the last one and a half decades. There has been neither a decline in the specialization in labor-intensive products, nor the expected shift towards more research-intensive reduction. This might reflect structural rigidities that constrain the ability of euro area firms to adjust rapidly. It could also mean that euro area firms have so far not been under significant pressure to make substantial changes in their specialization, particularly as regards medium high tech uh, exports. But this general picture for the euro area does, however, not necessarily hold for all euro area countries. There have been uh, very substantial differences in the export performance across individual countries, and euro area countries have witnessed significant differences in cost competitiveness since the launch of the euro. This explains why the ECB has always said that an appropriate peer surveillance of the evolution of competitiveness indicators, including cost competitiveness and unit labor costs, was of the essence. This brings me naturally to the second part of my talk, the internal dimension of European competitiveness. Understanding the causes of growing labor cost differentials or the cumulative increases in labor costs across euro area countries is very important for improving the adjustment process of countries within economic and monetary union. From an economist's perspective, increases in unit labor costs stem from higher compensation per employee or lower productivity, or of course, a combination of the two. In the case of the euro area, the main source of difference in recent years has been differences in the growth rates of compensation per employee rather than differences in productivity growth. Let's look at the reasons behind these differences and the options that countries have to improve their situation. Such analysis is particularly important in the present time. Some countries may not only be affected by the global downturn and the financial crisis, they may also need to adjust in order to undo domestic imbalances. I see four main developments which have arisen in the monetary union and which help to explain the observed differences in increases in labor costs uh, measured with the unit labor cost in a number of euro area countries. First explanation, some countries might have entered the euro area at a moment where this overall cost competitiveness was clearly hampered for a number of reasons. Uh, Germany offers a clear example of such an economy due to the strong increases of unit labor costs associated with the reunification. A lower level of increases in unit labor cost than the average of the euro area since the setting up of the euro was advisable for such economies for obvious reasons, catching up of previously lost competitiveness. Second, the opposite case has also been observed, or can be observed and has been observed. Some countries have entered the euro area in a position of relative over competitiveness. The Netherlands, for instance, had in 99 a very strong competitive position due to the success of their long-standing previous strategy of competitive disinflation. A higher level of increases of unit labor costs during several years is explainable, and I would say in some, some respect justifiable, in such a situation. Third, some countries might be or might have been catching up in terms of growth. Then they may have experienced relatively strong trend increases in per capita GDP. To the extent that these income per capita developments are sustainable, relatively strong wage increases are justifiable by reference to the fundamentals of the economy. 
These three first developments are economically justified and need not necessarily be a concern for policymakers. However, there is a fourth type of development which poses problems for the economies concerned. Some euro area countries have witnessed a long period of strong growth in domestic demand. These demand pressures were related to expectations of consumers or firms about future income and profit prospects, which it is now clear were overly optimistic. This situation was often accompanied or intensified by an insufficiently tight fiscal stance, even if headline fiscal numbers, uh, such as the deficit and the debt ratio, suggested a very healthy fiscal situation. Technically speaking, uh, government and the public might have over time mistakenly taken a cyclical or temporary expansion to be an upward shift, shift in potential output and long-term income growth. They thus took insufficient account of the impact of a possible downturn in activity on the public finances and private income. In simpler terms, this means nothing less than extrapolating the good times almost forever and accordingly increasing spending and indebtedness. In our economic models, we often speak about forward-looking agents, portraying households, firms, as making rational economic calculations with a watchful eye on the future. But in reality, we have to be aware of too many forward spending agents, private and public alike. Such a situation can stoke inflation and bring accumulated losses in competitiveness, lower export performance, and current account deficit. Moreover, it has often resulted not only in pressures on the prices of goods and services, but also in asset price inflation. In addition, in some cases, sizable wage increases in the public sector during normal or good times may have provided the wrong signals for wage bargaining in other sectors. The accumulation of relative losses in the cost competitiveness and the buildup of domestic imbalances need at some point to be corrected. The correction within the monetary union can and must be achieved through lower unit labor costs increases relative to the average of the union. In an environment of flexible wages and prices, this adjustment could proceed smoothly without significant losses in output and employment in comparison with the, I would say, uh, normal evolution taking into account, of course, the global influences. However, if the economy concerned suffers from structural rigidities in product and labor markets, a more protracted and more painful adjustment in output and employment will then finally take place. As enhancing flexibility has been a message that the ECB has championed for a long time, let me focus on such rigidities which uh, unfortunately appear to affect, and I would, I would not, I'm not speaking of any country in particular there, I, mean, I would say it's a general problem that we have to take into account. I believe there should be more public awareness than insufficient, that insufficient attention of wage setting to current and expected productivity developments makes any correction to previous loss, losses of competitiveness more painful in terms of output and employment losses. And I would like uh, now to turn to the current difficulties in the international economy, which uh, are having... Uh, a strongly negative impact on uh, all economies of the euro area, including the Irish economy. For many years, Ireland has been a great success story. Openness to trade, a high degree of flexibility have allowed the country to benefit substantially from globalization during the last decades. It uh, now has a very high income per capita, much higher than the average of the euro area, and it is characterized by a skilled workforce, a flexible labor market, moderate taxation, and a business-friendly regulatory environment. None of these advantages have been lost as a result of the global financial crisis, of course. But crucially for Ireland, 
This unprecedented international shock has come at the same time as the economy has been undergoing a necessary rebalancing in the composition of its growth, intensifying, of course, the challenges it faces. In particular, the construction and the banking sector are under a phenomenon of adjustment. The Irish government is acting resolutely to address the situation with the public finances. Important action is being taken to make immediate savings and plans are being drawn up for a return to compliance with the Stability and Growth Pact. A fiscal policy that convincingly reduces future public deficits is indeed absolutely essential. In addition, measures have been taken or are underway to recover lost competitiveness and to exploit the country's comparative advantages in, in its uh, high-tech, high-skills industries. What is crucial at this moment for all economic policy actors is to take measures that are both supportive of the current environment, in the current environment and in the longer term interests of the economy. Many euro area countries, despite some progress, still exhibit structural impediments triggered by a rigid legal and regulatory environment. Unemployment is a clear concern right now in many parts of the euro area, and we surely do not want to lose human capital or scar a large proportion of the people of working age. As I mentioned before, wage restraint would help a lot in this respect. More generally, in order to minimize job and output losses to the, related to the current downturn, it is vital that uh, uh, authorities and social partners pursue four objectives in the view of the ECB. First, wage settings uh, need to take into account of the competitiveness and labor market conditions in a responsible and timely manner. Second, authorities should pursue courageous policies of spending restraint, especially in the case of public wages. A prudent fiscal stance should be always in place. Third, the completion of the single market, particularly in services and network industries, should be achieved. A deeper integration of markets is crucial to foster competition and open product and labor markets. Measures that hinder free competition and cross-border trade must be avoided. In this context, it is, of course, at most, uh, of the utmost importance to resist protectionist pressures at all levels. Fourth, in the context of the Lisbon Agenda, the necessary, necessary reforms that enhance competition and improve long-term growth prospects in the euro area must be implemented, especially in this difficult times, such reforms are very important in all euro area countries to counteract the economic downturn and limit its negative impact on employment. The price of delaying reforms is particularly high at the current stage. For many years, we have been saying that we need structural reforms. The crisis offers us the opportunity, and I would say in many respects the obligation to seize the moment and implement the right reforms. They would help the economy overcome the crisis and be stronger afterwards. I also want to call, if I may, on European policymakers as a whole. As a lesson from the current crisis, we should consider ways how to strengthen our surveillance of competitiveness within the European Union, and in particular in the euro area. This should help countries to build stronger buffers in good times, and it should also help to avoid excessive increases in unit labor costs. In other words, this would prevent us from again extending public and private spendings beyond sustainable levels and experiencing difficulties similar to the current ones. Let me, if you permit, Mr. Chairman, conclude as you know better than me, the great Irish playwright George Bernard Shaw was not at all impressed by the economics profession. 
Uh, his was uh, the famous disparaging uh, remark that, uh, and I'm quoting, if all economists were led end to end, they would not reach a conclusion. <laughs> Certainly in these very challenging times, it is not easy for all economic policymakers to reach agreement on the way forward. But let me offer some avenues that I hope we can all agree. The euro area is resolutely addressing the challenges of the global financial turbulence, the global imbalances, and the resulting global slowdown. <clears throat> Looking forward, we need to continue with our efforts to make the euro area stronger, more flexible, more resilient, and more prosperous. The ECB's governing council, of which Governor uh, Hurley has been member for so, such many, so many years, uh, uh, is uh, tirelessly working to make the euro area better off. I am also optimistic about the prospects for this country. The Irish economy clearly faces severe challenges over the next few years, and hard decisions have been taken and will have to be taken. But in many ways, the Irish economy is an excellent example of some of the characteristics that foster global competitiveness. Its openness, its flexibility, high level, very high level of education. And this has paid off in very, very significant increases in income per capita over years. And we should never, never forget that. Some things will, of course, have to change. But none of the positive characteristics are lost, nor should they be lost in the crisis. In my view, the open nature of this economy with its associated flexibility and adaptability means that Ireland will be well placed to benefit greatly from the eventual recovery and to compete effectively in the global economy in the future. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.